Thank you for joining me today on Gift Biz Unwrapped. This is episode 88. It really is about belief in your product and a continued enthusiasm and just keep pushing it out there. Hi, this is John Lee Dumas of Entrepreneur on Fire, and you're listening to Gift Biz Unwrapped, and now it's time to light it up. Welcome to Gift Biz Unwrapped, your source for industry-specific insights and advice to develop and grow your business. And now, here's your host, Sue Monheit. Hi there, I'm Sue, and welcome to the Gift Biz Unwrapped podcast. Whether you own a brick and mortar store, sell online, or are just getting started, you'll discover new insight to gain traction and to grow your business. And today I have joining us Bill and Marianne Stank from Cookies in a Snap. With a background in architecture and design, Bill has long had an interest in product design and innovation. Cookies in a Snap was actually born out of an inspiring cookie making moment that led to a uniquely new way to shape and mold cookies. Bill and his wife, Marianne, are very much amateur bakers, but creative professionals excited about designing new products to make everyday moments special. Their goal is to make memories for adults and children engaged in the creative and fun activity of cookie baking. Welcome to the show, Bill. Good morning, Sue. How are you today? Very good. And I know you've got Marianne there too. She may pipe in from time to time, right? Yes, she can say hello this morning. Okay. Hi, Marianne. Hi, Sue. I'm so happy that you two are joining me, and it's perfect. We are actually recording this in early December. The Christmas trees are coming up, and so it's a perfect time to be talking all about cookies. So thank you so much for joining me this morning. Glad to have the opportunity to tell our story. Well, I like to start off by having our listeners get to know you in a little bit of a different way, and that is by having you describe your ideal motivational candle. So if you could help us envision what that would look like, what color is your candle, and what would be the quote on your candle? Well, I've always kind of favored the golden yellow color. Happens to be kind of a candle color anyway, but uh, that's been my favorite color my whole life. And although I don't have a specific quote, I very much like the word inspiration. I try to be inspired by other people, and I hope I inspire them as well. Perfect. And that's exactly what we're attempting to do here today. So that falls right in line with our goal. So I want to go back and talk about, you know, I mentioned in the intro that you had a quote unquote inspiring cookie making moment. And I want you to tell us exactly what happened. One day, Marianne was baking. She happened to be making peanut butter cookies. And just as I walked by, she pressed a fork in the two different directions that typically make the waffle pattern on top of peanut butter cookies, which seems to be a a universal way of shaping those cookies. And it occurred to me that what if there were different shaped, quote, forks to make different patterns on top of the dough? And that led to the idea of how could I develop that? I started doing sketches, drawings, and the product started to evolve. And I ended up working with a community college student locally. The Northampton County Community College has what they call the Fab Lab. And it has all kinds of tools and equipment, 3D printers, etc., that any entrepreneur in the area is free to use. So I started working with this particular student developed two very, very crude prototypes with 3D printing, very soon realized I needed to get some professional assistance and continued with the project from then on. We hired an industrial designer who has just been fantastic and ended up getting us to the final product that we now have. Wow. Okay. So that was a lot of the process and evolution of the product in a very short bit of time. So I want to break all this down a little bit. Were you interested in baking or had you spent a lot of time with Marianne or it was just like seriously you're walking through the kitchen and this idea comes to you? Really over the years I've always been in the creative line of work having an architectural background and then when I worked on my master's degree I finished that up in the year 2000 that was in marketing and that led me to be sort of more conscious of of products whether they're advertised on tv or magazines always kind of looking at things with a critical eye. So I'm always looking for some creative inspiration or ideas. And I've had many over the years, but this was one that as we continued to develop it, 
seem to be very practical, very useful, and we are getting very good feedback on it. And I just happened to be walking by as she pressed that fork onto the cookie dough. Otherwise, I might have missed it. (laughs) And that got me excited pretty much instantly about developing a product. So did Mary Ann think you were crazy when she said, because you must have stopped her and said, wait a minute, what do you do? Like you must have had some type of little conversation there when the idea came to you. Well, she stepped back because <laughs> I, was, I was quite excited. I said, I got an idea. And she, she knows over the years, ideas can pop up just about any time from my uh, way of thinking. I think the important thing for us all to note in your story is that you approach life in a way with that mindset of looking at things, observing things, as you were just mentioning, whether it's on TV or in the course of your life, and thinking of creative extensions of what you're seeing. And I guess that's because of your degree, but you also must have a mindset like that because I do know that you've looked at and thought through a number of different types of products. And this is just the one that looked like it was the right one to bring into full development. That's correct. Over the years, the more I've read, the more I've read about business and entrepreneurial type people and product innovations, it's almost a matter of being conscious of almost any little inconvenience in our own lives and how can we solve that problem and make things easier for the general public to solve their particular problems with a new product. All right. So gift biz listeners, if any of you are thinking, you know, I want to do something for myself, I want to start something and you're not sure what that is because I hear from you a lot that you want to and you just don't know what it is, this is the type of mindset to get in. Be very observant of your life and your day as you're going through because if you have that mindset and you're set like that, just I'm sure Bill did not walk through his kitchen thinking I'm going to have the idea of a lifetime right now. It just happened, but his mind was open to the opportunity. So a little nugget for you guys to think through starting right now. Okay, so you have this idea and you start drawing things up and you already knew about the resource in your community in terms of the college initially? Yeah, I'd been aware of that for some years. There are several entrepreneurial type groups in the Lehigh Valley and I'd been on some email lists and I had attended various seminars open to the public talking about starting businesses, entrepreneurial efforts. The same community college had offered a six-week, one-day-a-week program on starting your own business, licenses, patents, all those types of information that someone would want to be aware of. And you know these types of resources are mentioned, just the same as SCORE, which meets monthly, which helps business owners as well. Right. All right. And so that then could take you only so far, right? So th- that was good that you were, you were able to work and progress to a certain point. And then as you were just mentioning, you needed to bring in some professionals. Talk that through with us a little bit. Well, oddly enough, the idea happened about four years ago. Once we started realizing the product was something that would become sort of a modular, changeable disk that would snap in place, I came up with the name Cookies in a Snap, and we actually purchased the URL almost five years ago now. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the recession hit, so we just weren't in a position to proceed with the product. But I had talked to the local industrial designer back at that time, gave me some estimates on injection molding and his engineering services, and at the time they seemed a bit high for us to proceed. But with technology, so many things are becoming less and less expensive. So it was actually a little easier to do in the last year or so. But at that time, I put it aside. We had gone to the International Houseware Show in Chicago one time. And then after that, we went a couple other times just to do some research, see which products are out there, see if there was anything similar. And we started learning quite a bit about the housewares business. And so when I went back to the industrial designer It's almost two years ago. January will be two years. Showed him the product, reviewed it. There was a a characteristic about it that he said, you know, if we just made this one change, I think you'd have a very good product. And it was almost an inspirational moment for him. And he earned his money right there before I even hired him. We started working on the product. We did several 3D prototypes that were solid shapes. And then we started working with 
clear plastics, colored tops, and just refined it from there. Okay. And some of our listeners at this point might be thinking, you know, what type of an investment is there to even get this started? And I'm not asking you for specific numbers, but someone was had, had an idea. And again, now yours, I'm sure it varies by product, right? But if someone was thinking about that, what type of dollars, just from your experience, do you think you'd need to have available to start putting together just to the point of a prototype? Well, I think getting to a prototype, depending on your product, it can be, I don't know, let's say $1,000 up to several thousand dollars. I attended a seminar recently given by Bucks County Community College Entrepreneurial Initiative, which is where I work at Bucks County Community College. And the guest speaker indicated that almost all companies that are started do not have a unique or innovative idea. They started with less than $5,000. And there's not a high degree of technology. You're not necessarily writing a new program, a new app. Many things are quite simple. And so a lot of ideas can be started quite inexpensively. When you need to start getting into injection molds, then your expenses are going to start getting higher. But in my case, part of the difficulty is I have an injection mold to do the lids. I have an injection mold to do the bodies of the product. And I have two injection molds which make four of the discs each. So if the product was something simple, something that snaps on top of a soda can or does some type of little kitchen gadget, if it's one mold, it certainly can be reasonably priced compared to the investment that I had to make for basically four different injection molds. That makes sense. And it occurs to me at this point that we really haven't described in detail what cookies in a snap actually looks like. So let's talk about that because you're talking about the various parts and I can envision that totally. But just describe a little bit for someone who's listening and maybe out walking their dog, they can't get to a computer to real quickly see the website, but just describe a little bit what the product specifically is. The, The complete package with the case and then the inside and all that. Okay. Well, the product started to develop with the idea that you could both cut the shape of a round cookie and mold a shape on top of that cookie, a star, a spiral, a depressed center to put jelly in, etc. So the product evolved so that you could, in one single motion, pressing down on the dough that you've rolled to a specific thickness, and in this particular design, it's one quarter inch, so that when you press down with the product, it's cutting and shaping and molding all in that one pressing motion. And the idea was to make the product clear so that when you're pressing down, looking down into the product, you can actually see the dough squish up and fill the mold, which is fun for anyone to do. And my grandkids particularly like watching that. (laughs) Well, and the other thing that I think is ingenious is the container for the different molds is also the handle, if you will, of the cookie press. You snap in the different parts, but they're also stored as one. So it's all one concise package. Yes. When we started with the idea that we would hold something and press down to cut the shape of the cookie, and it could just as easily be square cookies instead of round. But when we started working with something that you would hold in your hand to be able to press down on the dough, we started to realize that that could become the container for the discs as well. So the disc snaps in the bottom, but when you're finished, all the discs can now snap, just drop in the top, and you put the cap on it, and it stores all the parts in itself. There's no old box falling apart that you put a rubber band around or old plastic bag with a variety of small parts and a wire tie. Right. I like what you're talking about here in that we're really seeing a demonstration of how the product evolved. You went from prototype and then one thing led to another, then the shape, then the idea of being able to store it all together. Your concept initially didn't include necessarily all those elements, but it became the product that it is today over a little bit of time. That's correct. One of the things that we did identify early on was, could I make the disk clear, but the part that everything could store in the product itself That was something that evolved over time. Mm -hmm. One of the things that many people have in some way compared it to or at least said that it's much neater than is a cookie press. Changing a disc and trying to get the dough in and out 
this is a much cleaner, simpler to use product. And again, I want to just slip in a point that you a little bit glossed over because you didn't need to, but I want to talk about this with our listeners. You had this idea of cookies in a snap and went and grabbed the URL right away. That's correct. Domain names are not expensive, you guys. All you have to do is go to GoDaddy. If you have an idea, and I'll tell you, for this podcast, I wasn't initially sure what I was going to name it. I think I purchased like 20 different URLs, 20 different ideas, because I wanted to make sure that I had them. Now, eventually I zeroed in on one of them, and now since I've released all of the other ones, but you can buy names even just for a year. And I would advise you, if you have a name that you really like, just how Bill is talking, you know, this was the name, it sounded perfect, and maybe there were two or three or four different ideas. Grab those URLs right away if they're available so you don't miss out on them down the road. One thing I will add to that is if you really like the name and you're going to proceed, make sure you put it on automatic renewal because the day you miss renewing, that URL will be gone. Someone will grab it. Good point. And you always get notices that it's going to automatically renew too. So That's correct. Yeah. And I would also, since we're on this topic check out Facebook pages and other things to see if they're available. If you think you're going to wait a little bit, it's your risk of someone taking that. But it's nice to have something very concise and and that they all match each other. Any social media sites as well as your URL. So, okay, I want to move on now. So you've got your prototype. And then what happens next? What do you do after you have a prototype you've pretty much zeroed in on? Well, we started working with a marketing firm here in the Lehigh Valley to develop promotional material. And our main objective, I mean, besides selling on Amazon, you know, as we get miscellaneous orders and more attention, our goal is primarily to approach the housewares industry and sell wholesale to retailers, baking and cooking type stores, Bed Bath and Beyond, etc. So our big push will be when we get to the International Housework Show in March of 2017. We did promote our product pretty widely to friends and relatives and sold quite a few hundred, which helped give us some cash, some seed cash to keep proceeding. Certainly it was helpful, although our investment was more than what we did pick up by selling locally. But we knew that was going to be the case. We just wanted to enlist as much help as we could and and let people get the actual product after we had done a preliminary production run. Sure. And you're also getting feedback on the product. Exactly. Exactly. You're talking about the fact that you really made a conscious choice of which market you're going after. You're not going direct to the consumer. You're going to the stores who will then supply the product. That'll be our bigger market, yes. Okay, so that planning is going on. How do you actually get this product made? You've got the prototype. How does it jump from a prototype to now you have something that you can exchange for money? Once we had finalized and really the last couple 3D prototypes we printed, we were making very fine tuning little adjustments. How thick the dough should be? Should it be 316? Should it be a quarter inch? The little tabs that the discs snap in and out that hold it in place. Were they too big? Were they too small? I had told the industrial designer to proceed with the injection molds. So then the factory ran 20 samples for us, sent them back. And initially the discs were very hard to snap in. So we had to modify the injection mold. The next time they were too loose, we had to modify the injection mold, but that was all part of the price they had quoted for me to adjust things until I was satisfied. It worked out really well. They did an excellent job. I worked through the industrial designer who has connections with factories that he has worked with for the last 20 years. Factories that he trusts, that he knows the quality. And I've heard many stories of people who have hired factories around the world only to have their product show up and not be acceptable. My industrial designer receives the product, inspects it, And I don't pay him until he and I are both happy with the quality. So it's not like it left the factory, you bought it, it's yours. Actually, when my first production run came in, instead of eight different discs, he did a quality inspection. After he checked about 50 of them, he found one that had a duplicate disc in it. He checked all of the production run for me at no additional cost. He wasn't happy with the factory, 
but that was part of the quality control he had promised in his price. So I've been very happy working with a single source for the product and for the design. Absolutely. I mean, it costs a little bit more money to go that route, but you know you've got proven and known resources in people that he's used before. And, you know, let's face it, none of us who have never done a product before know everything that an industrial designer would know. So I think well worth it. You touch on another point from the entrepreneurial seminar I went to about a month and a half ago, you know, that most products are not unique and innovative. Most investments are pretty small. The other is that most people actually start a business in a field that hasn't been their main experience. I'm making a cookie product for the housewares industry, and my background is more in design and construction of buildings and renovations on college campuses. Yeah, very good point. So go with people who have been there before and know what they're doing. Yes, it's worth the extra expense to get it done right. Okay, so all of this sounds good. And so... Just again, to ground everybody, how long has the product actually been out and being marketed? Uh, about three months now. Okay, so brand new. Yes, um, so there's a lot, a lot of future ahead, which is super exciting. What struggles have you had to get to this point? Is there any huge challenge that really, really, you just weren't sure if it was going to work? And how did you then overcome it to get to where you are today? Well, the biggest struggle, I would say, was actually getting our financial resources together because my wife and I were both working full time and going back the five years, four and a half years to when we first got the URL and the idea, my wife was working for a local university. The recession hit. She was let go after 11 years. The job I had at that time was dependent on raising money and to do any new construction and renovation. And their fundraising campaign essentially evaporated to nothing. So, oh boy. so the recession was uh, pretty hard on both of us. I happily switched jobs and started working for a local hospital in their facilities department. Marianne found another job. And so when we recovered from that, we found ourselves now you know, in a better financial position to proceed with the product. And we started slowly. You know, I started working with the industrial designer. And once I felt confident in the product, then I worked with the local video production company. So we took it step by step. And the more we did, the more we were confident in the product, the more it continued to look good. And after well over two years now, since the first sketches, I'm very, very pleased with the product. I haven't gotten bored with it. I haven't started to question the quality of it. And I think that's a very good thing to have. Okay. So you are still in the introduction stages, but has there been some event or maybe it's the video that you have? I'm not sure. But what types of things are you seeing that people are reacting to? They're seeing the product and it's a positive vibe that's moving the business forward. Well, one of the things was last year when we went to the housewares show in Chicago in March, we did have our video finished, although we didn't have any production samples at the time. We, the video was made using the 3D printed product. But when we showed various vendors and people in Chicago the video, they were very excited about it. There is a distributor in Canada who has talked to us about exclusive distribution rights. We've been in touch, and we will be catching up in March at the Houseware Show. Wonderful. And what types of reactions? Now, you, most of this has been, as you were saying, family, friends. I know you've been to a consumer show recently where you're ex now exposing people to cookies in a snap. What type of reaction have you been getting from people? People have commented primarily they like that it's small and compact. They like the main feature is that it's self-storing, that all the parts fit within the product itself. And we started realizing a lot of people were commenting on the comparison to a cookie press. So that's why I mentioned it earlier in the discussion. It's something that comes up quite a bit. And we have the potential to create more discs, dozens and dozens of discs of different design, uh, Christmas sets, animal cookies, dinosaurs, almost everything and anything for any holiday or event. We could make discs and sets of different themes and, and expand the product to be an entire brand of cookie making products. Sure, because once you get that first one down, it becomes easier from there. 
Oh, definitely. Yeah, in terms of themes and then also sizes, are you looking at now different sizes as well? That's right, we can. I've already talked about cookies in a snap minis, cookies in a snap squared, which would be almost a cookie that might be shaped similar to a chessman cookie. Uh, it'd probably be square rather than rectangular, but you know, slightly rounded corners. Mm -hmm. So the dough comes out very easily. Yeah, or like shortbread-ish type cookie or something. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. You mentioned shortbread. The recipes that we have on our website, we have tested and we continue to try and refine them because you need a dough mixture that is going to hold its shape when it's baked. And that's one of the features of the recipes that we have online. Now that you're saying that, I am envisioning a cookbook that goes along with one of the cookie and a snap themes, maybe it's for children, where it's like all compact all together and you sell as a set. How about that? <laughs> oh, that, that could be interesting, yeah. Recipes, I mean, it's an automatic extension down the road, you're way in the beginning, I get it. Real quick question about trademarking or patenting or what do you need to do for a product such as yours? What I've learned early on and Reading I did online, uh, when we were at the International Houseware Show, the United States Trademark Patent Office always has a booth there with plenty of free information. If you go public with your product early, you have a year to patent the product, to, to apply for a patent. But if you work with industrial designers, marketing firms, etc., and have them sign non-disclosure agreements, which I did, you can keep working on it for more than that year, and you can then file for a patent. So non-disclosure agreements give you a longer window to work on your product. They also help protect that information from being distributed or getting out there early. After that, you can apply for a provisional patent, which we did. The patent's about 95% complete, but it gives you a one-year window before you have to apply for the final patent. And we did that in January of 2016. So we will file the final technical patent before January of 17. We also did a search. We did a patent search. We did a trademark search and applied for a trademark cookies and a snap and that has been granted. Wonderful, congratulations on that. Your trademark protects your name. The patent, does it protect just the design of the discs, the whole structure? I mean, what are you covered with in a patent? Actually, I have two different patents. We have the provisional patent, which will become the final technical patent, and we have a design patent. The design patent protects the actual shape and physical design of the product. The technical patent, or it's actually called a utility patent, protects the technical features. The fact that there's a particular engineered component that allows you to be able to both shape the cookie and cut the cookie and have different 3D impressions, raised areas, depressed areas. The fact that all that works with one simple press is kind of the, the secret sauce of the patent that no one else had done in terms of cookie making, cookie cutters, cookie shaping products. Got it. And very smart to get all of that taken care of and covered at the onset. Yes. You know, I, mean, I mean, there's a certain window of opportunity, and if it passes, you're out of luck. Also, once you do apply for a patent, you have six months in which to apply for international patents. After that, you're out of luck. We did apply, oddly enough, for a Chinese design patent. We talked to several people at the International Houseware Show. One of the companies, their product was being copied. It was being sold on Alibaba, but they had the Chinese patent and the Chinese uh, Alibaba stopped selling it. From what he told me, they will ignore American patents and trademarks, but they will respect their own. So it was, I'd say, a modest fee to get the Chinese patent. Interesting. Patent. Yeah, good point. Good point. So then they had to pull the product from Alibaba? They did. That's a good result then. Bill, I want to turn now into our reflection section. This is a look at you in a little bit of a different way and some of the things that you're doing day to day to make you successful. Do you have a natural trait, either you or Marianne, that you feel has really helped you to be successful? 
I'm perpetually optimistic. I mean, even when I have a bad day or a bad week, I recover very quickly and I make a list of things I can do to try and move the project forward. Is recovery just time away and then you approach it with a, a new thought or is there anything else that you do? I do some reading. I've got a couple books. I also save some articles. Right now I subscribe to Entrepreneur, Fast Company, and Inc. Magazine. And as I read them, I'll underline certain phrases or paragraphs. You know, maybe every other issue or so, I tear out a page that was particularly inspiring about someone who had hit some roadblocks and, and just kept pushing on and kept moving forward. And it's, it's always good to have reminders of that. This doesn't happen overnight. Overnight success is pretty rare. Right. So it's inspiring, that word that I mentioned earlier in the interview. It's inspiring to see others succeeding, having hit roadblocks, and they keep working. And that's what I keep trying to do. I see this as a three to five year window to assess how successful it's going to be. I'm not looking at this as six months or a year down the road. It takes time. A friend of mine who I graduated college with said, the number one thing to do is just keep pushing it out there. So that's my plan. And we'll see where we are in three or five years. Sounds good. Well, you didn't rush the development process, which I think was really wise. And you know, you've taken solid steps in terms of covering the concept and the design and all of that. And now you're into the marketing promotion stage. And like you said, you're going to see and already the initial reactions have been great. So you continue on. It's a story that is in the middle of its novel. I don't know what to say about that. Well, you mentioned uh, I didn't rush the, the development process. That's true. But the initial schedule I had was shorter than the time it took. So, Oh, interesting. Okay. I found that both in design and construction, in other initiatives, you know, how long it's going to take me to renovate my kitchen or anything else. So if anyone out there is thinking, I can get this done in six months, think more like a year. If you think you could do it in a year, it's probably going to take two. Double it up. You can always be surprised on the quicker side, I guess. <laughs> That's right. Do you use a tool or, or some type of app or anything that helps you to be productive in your day? I keep a list on my iPhone. I also carry, a, call it a little journal, like a five by eight book with you know nothing in it except lines. And I make notes about either ideas or things I wanted to get done or someone I need to call. And I keep it with me. I, I write down most days what I accomplished, what I did. So I can go back and look three, five, ten days ago and say, oh, there was a, a note there to call someone or send an email or an idea for a marketing approach. Your point is, though, you put it down either on your phone, maybe the notes app or something. That's right. Yeah. Or on paper. So you're not just randomly going from one task to another. You have a plan. True. I like the paper because when you're in art and design school, they encourage you to sketch and draw and keep notes. So it's kind of a trademark of people in the design field. I mean, I know there's all kinds of apps and software and the computers can do everything, but the design school still encourage you to draw manually and sketch. It's a different type of activity when you're trying to be creative. You'd be surprised, Bill, and it might be because most of the people that we interview are creators in one way or another, but more often than not, people are talking about the just the hand to paper, you know, the physical notebook or journal or sticky note tasks or whatever, more than I would have expected, to be quite honest. But I'm glad because that's the way I gravitate to. I've tried some of these other apps and for some things it serves well, but just for your list and your to-do and day-to-day, I like the, the pen and paper. <laughs> so I'm right with you there. Yes, it's easy to edit, cross out, add an extra note, put something in the margin and let it evolve as it needs to. Totally agree. Have you read a book that you think our listeners could find value in? This is going to sound a little odd. Well, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll mention two books. Years ago, someone recommended Awaken the Giant Within by Tony Robbins, which has kind of been my go-to book. I've read it three or four times, and if I need a little encouragement, I'll read 20 or 30 pages. But in the recent year, during the political campaigns, as they were, someone had mentioned Trump's The Art of the Deal and were critical of it because he... They almost said he was lying in the book. So I thought, well, you know what? I could find a used copy online, which I did for like a dollar plus a dollar ninety nine shipping. I bought the book 
And I have to admit, I didn't finish the book, but I read well over half of it. He's not lying. He has a vision. He's excited about it. And he's promoting and selling it, his vision, to other people. And that's what all of us as entrepreneurs have to do. We have to be excited about our product. We have to tell people why it's good. And that's all he was doing. It really is about belief in your product and a continued enthusiasm and just keep pushing it out there. So when you're talking about the art of the deal, it's not necessarily or only, shall I say, the content of what he was saying. It was the method and the fact that he was excited about it and sharing the idea. It's the whole concept of the book versus the content of the book. Exactly. All right. Well, Gift Biz listeners, just as you're listening to the podcast today, you can also listen to audiobooks with ease. I've teamed up with Audible for you to be able to get an audiobook for free on me if you haven't done so already. All you need to do is go to giftbizbook.com and make your selection. Okay, Bill, now is the time when I invite you to dare to dream. I'd like to present you with a virtual gift. It's a magical box containing unlimited possibilities for your future. So this is your dream or your goal of almost unreachable heights that you would wish to obtain. Please accept this gift and open it in our presence. What is inside your box? The box contains what I'll call a palette of cookie making opportunity. Sets of discs, different size cookies, different shapes, and all in a complete package to take care of any holiday season, birthday, or event, and make a variety of cookies and flavors for any occasion. And who has created this palette of all of these different varieties of cookies? Well, Marianne and I <laughs> <laughs> working uh, diligently to build a brand and create that large collection of designs and discs and themes. Hopefully someday that will include uh, licensed uh, characters and Oh, that's cool. Uh, opportunities. That is cool. Yeah, you know, one of the reasons I do this question is for people to put out there what they're wanting. And I, you know, you've been talking about it a little bit through the podcast in terms of what your vision is. It just doesn't stop right here. You have product line extensions. And so your dream is just receiving and seeing that come to reality which is beautiful. You're exactly right. And, you know, as it, as it grows, we could certainly start having our own brand name of cookie spatula, cooking pans. I mean, it doesn't just have to be the cutting and shaping type product that we've been discussing. True. You never know where it's going to go. I'm going to have to keep an eye on you. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're hopeful and optimistic, of course. So I hear Marianne there in the background. How many cookies are you making for this holiday season? Oh, well, in about two weeks, when my semester will be over for the fall, I will be very busily making tons and tons of cookies to share with family and friends. And we have in mind to be doing some local craft shows here in our area. So we've already have one scheduled for next Saturday. And hopefully, we'll be able to spread the word about this product. Wonderful. And where are you in the world? We're in Allentown, Pennsylvania, which is about 50 miles north of Philadelphia. Okay, so if anybody is listening from that area and you're going to a craft show, I want you to specifically look for Bill and Marianne's booth because they might just be there. Then you're going to go up to them and say, hey, I heard you on Sue's podcast. How about that? That sounds great. <laughs> All right. Every little bit helps. Exactly. Well, I want people to see it, too. It's an awesome product. I just love it. And I, I actually saw you live at one of the recent shows, and I have cookies in a snap. It's actually here in my office. I wanted to save it and leave it here until we did the podcast. But I'm going to be using it this holiday season, that's for sure. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else can see the video at cookiesinasnap.com. While we were at the show a couple of weeks ago, a retailer also bought 30 of them wholesale for demonstration during their Black Friday promotions. Wow, wonderful. Okay, Gift Biz listeners, you now have heard where you can see more about Cookies in a Snap, and you also know there's a show notes page that will give you, once again, the website and also the social media site. So if you want to see more versions and more ideas and everything about Cookies in a Snap, you go to the show notes page and we'll have all that there for you. 
Bill and Marianne, thank you so much for being on the show today. I know you're so passionate about the product. I was fortunate enough, as I just said, to see you in person, see the love you have for the product. It's such an exciting story. And I really appreciate your jumping on here today when you're still part of the story. I mean, you're still so new and there's so much future yet ahead of you, but I'm glad we caught you right at this point in time. Much success for you. I know Cookies in a Snap is going to be absolutely a game changer for the cookie making industry and may your candles always burn bright oh, thank, Th- you thank you so very much. much we appreciate your support and look forward to staying in touch with you absolutely where are you in your business building journey whether you're just starting out or already running a business and you want to know your setup for success find out by taking the gift biz quiz Access the quiz from your computer at bit.ly slash giftbizquiz or from your phone by texting giftbizquiz to 44222. Thanks for listening and be sure to join us for the next episode. Today's show is sponsored by the Ribbon Print Company. Looking for a new income source for your gift business? Customization is more popular now than ever. Brand your products with your logo or print a happy birthday Jessica ribbon to add to a gift right at checkout. It's all done right in your shop or craft studio in seconds. Check out the ribbonprintcompany.com for more information. After you listen to the show, if you like what you're hearing, make sure to jump over and subscribe to the show on iTunes. That way you'll automatically get the newest episodes when they go live. And thank you to those who have already left a rating and review. By subscribing, rating, and reviewing, you help to increase the visibility of Gift Biz Unwrapped. It's a great way to pay it forward to help others with their entrepreneurial journey as well.